Um, so, thank you very much for having me. My name is Catherine Borman and I'm a Development Officer for the Heritage Lottery Fund and I'm based in the Yorkshire region. So I know for all of you, some of you have come from far and wide, some of you are based in this region. So we'll be able to talk to your local development teams, we have one in every region and country, if you have project ideas or if you're working with community groups. So at the end or later on, feel free to go onto our website and you'll be able to get the contact details for all of the different development teams. I'm here today because Tara asked me to come and speak to you all as Skills for the Future um, trainees and as part of that programme to give you a bit of an idea of who we are as a funder, what we do, what our strategy is, what our framework is, also to give you some practical examples of the types of projects we fund and I know some of you are working on, on them so hopefully I won't go over any that you already know about and also some practical tips for if you're working with community groups, the types of things that they might need to think about if they are applying to us as a funder. So a bit of background, we are a lottery funder, our money comes from the National Lottery, people who pay their money and buy their tickets. We have been awarding grants since 1994 and we've awarded nearly £6 billion to Heritage. And I say that because it's really important, we are the largest funder of Heritage in the UK and to us it's really important that we can make transformational changes to maintain and protect our nation's amazing heritage and I'm sure as you sit here you're all buying into that because of the, the profession that you're doing and how you're moving forward. We have £375 million nationally to award every year at the moment, that is dependent on lottery ticket sales, but that is a lot of money that can do a lot of good. Within that we do fund a huge range of heritage because for us heritage is pretty much anything you can think of that should be protected and preserved for future generations. So it is buildings, it is archaeology, it's also cultures and traditions, it's archives, it's the natural environment, it's landscapes. So it's a really broad range and it's something that as you go out and move in the sector, hopefully that will come become apparent with the types of projects you encounter, but also with the interests that some of the groups you might work with have as they move forward. I'm sure all of you are very aware current economic climate and the impact that it's having around. Now, this does present challenges for us as a funder and we have been in a unique position for a few years now that our, our funding has stayed at a relatively stable level because it is outside of government domain. But it doesn't mean that we can substitute or prop up where there have been cuts in local authorities and by government. But what we can do is we can support the sector and we can aim to be responsive to the needs of the sector as a whole. It does also mean that we have seen a huge increase in the level of competition for our funding. So although we have more money than we did, say five years ago, we also have many more applications coming through. So what we have is the development teams who are there to support groups to help them put in strong applications as they move forward. We moved to a new strategic framework last year and it is a framework and not a plan and that's deliberate on our part because we want to try and be responsive and flexible and collaborative with the whole heritage sector. We want to ensure that we can continue to fund the broad range of heritage, that we have different options for how people can access our money, whether that's through our open grant programmes or through targeted schemes like the landscape partnerships that look at huge landscape conservation areas. We want to make sure that we work strategically and in partnership with key organisations such as the CBA, English Heritage and all those other key stakeholders in the different sectors. It also allows us to respond to the needs of the sector. You're all sat, or most of you are sat here today because you were involved in Skills for the Future in some way or another. That was one of our ways of addressing the need that came from the sector that there were gaps in the skills across different heritage areas, whether that be the natural environments, whether it was museums, libraries and archives, archaeology, or even industrial skills like boiler restoration. What we did was we created a programme that, where we could help support people to train, retrain, and ensure that as we move forward, as a whole sector, we have the relevant skills to ensure that we're a robust sector moving forward. With that strategic framework, we moved fully to outcomes. And I'm sure if any of you have ever applied for funding before, you have encountered this word and this 
this idea of outcomes. What we want is to see the difference that our projects, our investments will make under three different headings. And for us, we're looking for differences to be made for the heritage, hopefully that's quite obvious, we are the Heritage Lottery Fund, for people, because people are at the heart of heritage. Without people like yourselves, like the community groups you work with, it's not, it's not worthwhile restoring the building. You need people to understand that building, to understand that site, so that they feel engaged with it and want to protect it and make sure it's there for another 10, 50, 100 years. And also for communities. I mentioned earlier, we've seen over the last 20 years that our investment and heritage can have really broad-reaching outcomes and differences that it makes. I know when we started funding projects, I don't think we expected some of our funds to have a difference in impact on community cohesion. But some of our projects have, because they've explored cultural heritage and traditions. They've brought two towns together that maybe didn't always work together because they were down the end of the road, or they did a different industry. That's not the heritage they had. But the projects have brought them together. It's given them a shared understanding and a shared basis that heritage can bring. So under all of our grant programmes, we ask projects and groups to meet or show how they will make a difference in relation to a series of outcomes. There are 14 in total, and that sounds like a lot, but we don't expect people to meet all of them. What we're looking for is quality, a real difference, a step change from where you are now into the, what the difference the project will bring. We are quite explicit about what those outcomes are, and as I say, we group them under three headings. I won't go through them because you can see them and I know that Tara has mentioned that you're hopefully going to have got a printout in your packs as well. What I want to give you an idea of is the kinds of activities that might meet these outcomes. So for example, projects that we fund might look at conserving buildings or objects so that they can be better displayed or interpreted. They might record people's memories so that that is identified and put in the public record. It might be going out to archaeological sites and doing further investigation so that people can understand what was there and, again, use that with schools, with different local community groups. <coughs> it might be passing on traditions and cultures and preserving them for the future. And it might also be telling different stories of heritage and different interpretations of events through different means. For people, the one that we're looking for pretty much every project to meet is that people will learn about heritage. As I mentioned, we put people at the heart of heritage and it's important that they learn and understand what it is that we feel is important, you feel is important. We put the onus back on the groups that are applying to us to tell us what their heritage is and why it's important. So we want people to learn about heritage. We want That might be through formal educational means, it might be more, in, more informal, it might be through visits to different sites, to exhibitions. It might be allowing people to tra train in new skills, whether that's research skills, becoming a, a local guide, a volunteer guide, or archaeological skills. It might be through volunteering their time. And we hope that every project we fund will allow people to have an enjoyable experience. I don't think people get involved in projects unless they're going to enjoy themselves, most people don't put themselves through that. And then for communities, we have a broad range of this because as I said, we found that actually projects that we funded often had impacts that we weren't necessarily expecting. So this new outcomes framework allows people to really show the difference in the range of areas that their project might make. They're not always going to be relevant for every project, but certainly getting more in a wider range of people, it might be opening up heritage to a new audience, to an audience that hasn't been involved in your project before, whether that's younger children, it might be older people, it might be different ethnic communities. There are lots of different ranges of people that you might bring into your project. And similarly, projects might help your area become a better place to live, work and visit. It might provide economic boosts. So there are wider things to think about as you move forward and look at projects with groups. There are a few key things to remember if you are applying to HLF. We are a project-specific funder, and by that we mean that we fund projects that are time-limited, have specific outcomes, and have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Fortunately, we can't fund ongoing work or a continuation of an organisation's everyday activities or core business. We have to be additional. All projects must have a heritage focus 
And it sounds really obvious, but we do in these current economic climates get a lot of inquiries from groups where they think because they've got an old building, it automatically makes it heritage. If that old building is a cricket pavilion and they want to refresh and revamp their facilities, it's probably not for us. So it's again, it's making sure that what the activity and the project is doing is about engaging people with that heritage. And we ask projects to be planned. We ask people to have thought about what they want to do, how long it might take them, and to make sure that as they go forward, they, we can see and the group can see a way forward. We can see that it's manageable, it's realistic, and it's achievable. We get some very grand visions that would be amazing, they're not always going to be practical. Sometimes they need to be broken down. There are some things that we won't or are unlikely to fund. As I've said, if it doesn't focus on heritage, if it's the existing business or organisation's core business, we won't fund that. We won't fund existing staff, but we can fund new staff or the extension to part-time staff to help deliver projects. And we won't fund work that's already started. As I said, we're a project-specific funder, and consequently, we want to have that beginning of If anyone's ever been on our website, I'm sure you've seen there's a huge array of information, and there are, I think we've now got 20 grant programmes. I don't expect you to know all of them, and most of them are probably not going to be appropriate for you or the types of groups you're likely to be working with. So, what I've done is I've put up here what we tend to refer to as our open grant programs. So these are the ones that are open all year round. Some of them do have deadlines. Again, it varies from area to area, so check on your local team's pages. But these are the ones that basically you can look at the wide range of those outcomes and find a project that fits within there. The Sharing Heritage and First World War programs are what we call our kind of, our, our starters almost. It's a great way to introduce groups who haven't been involved in lottery funding or with, or with HLF into how to receive funding. They're straightforward and simple application forms and they're quite short in comparison to some of our other ones. If any of you have ever looked at our forms or been involved in them, some of them are quite lengthy. Um, we give grants of three to ten thousand pounds and there's no need for match funding within those programmes, which for small community groups can be a huge relief as they move forward. The First World War programme, obviously, it is the commemorations of the centenary of the First World War, and this programme will be open up until 2018-19. It's there to help local communities to learn about and commemorate the impact of the First World War on their local area. We've seen a lot of war memorial restorations within this, but also looking at the impact of other areas, untold stories um, from the First World War, such as the role of women in the war, or what it was like for rural communities when, for example, horses were requisitioned, how do you plan the fields? How did life carry on on the home front? We then have our, our Heritage Programme, and we have seen quite a few um, community archaeology projects funded under this. It's grants of 10 to 100,000, and again, there isn't necessarily a requirement to have match funding for this programme. And then Young Roots, which is aimed at getting young people aged 11 to 25, so if any of you are involved in the Young Archaeologist Clubs, this might be a really good one to bear in mind, um, to get young people involved actively in their heritage, making choices about what they think is important, and then how they want to interpret and share that with other people. Heritage Grants is the big one. It's a mandatory two-round application process, whereas all of the other ones I've spoken about are single rounds. It's one application, eight-week decision times. Heritage Grants, because the, grant, the amounts of money are larger, we're asking for more information and a bit more planning time. So it's a two-round application process, and we, I would say get in touch with your local team early and start discussing the process with them about what you're looking to do, the scales of investment, and what you're looking to do, whether it's staff costs, actual digs, investigations. Give them a heads up, fill in the inquiry form, and it'll start that dialogue going. But I'll give you some examples, and I actually looked through the list, and I saw that some, some people might actually be involved in some of these projects. So they are all Yorkshire-based examples, because I know most about the projects in Yorkshire. 
Road to Deployment, Elmer Archaeological Service, which is a social enterprise, received just under £10,000 to basically undertake investigations of the Silverwood Newhall Training Camp, which is where the Barnsley Pals Battalion did their training before they went off to the home to the trenches. So what they're doing is they're involving local community groups and local schools to undertake some investigatory work and then to actually undertake some trial digs and some test pits on the site so that they can understand the impact of the Barnsley Battalion and having that camp in the area on what happened, how that impacted Barnsley as a whole. So the volunteers are going to get training from professional archaeologists in different skills and they're going to actually undertake digs, be involved in helping identify any of the finds and then producing a publication at the end of it so that that material, that investigation is out in the public domain as well. Breath of Ancient Air, this was led by a friends group um, and they basically look after, in relationship with the council, an ancient woodland and they had an idea that there might be more to the history of this ancient woodland than they originally knew and they wanted to investigate whether or not there were prehistoric enclosures within the ancient woodlands. So again, they worked with, or under the management of a community archaeologist to make sure that all the work was above board, that they weren't actually doing any damage to the heritage. They undertook exploratory work, they did the desk-based research, and then they also trained to give guided tours around the woodland and also to identify to a wider audience what the different earthworks, the different mounds, the ridges, what it all meant, so that the people who didn't necessarily have an archaeological background could understand what they were seeing. I'm sure a lot of this is sounding very familiar to you in the work that you've been doing and hopefully the work that you're going out. And hopefully what you're seeing as well is that there are ways that you, you can work and use your experience to help support these groups as they move forward. In relation to archaeology, there are two main ways in which we fund archaeology through our projects. We'll see it as part of a wider conservation programme. So if we're doing work to landscapes, to historic buildings, part of that will be watching briefs. It will be making sure that nothing is going to happen that will damage the heritage and that the planned work is going to go ahead smoothly. That will all be factored in as part of a wider heritage project. We then also have the projects that focus specifically on archaeology, on sharing that information, that training, that skills, and also how to interpret the data and make it, put it in a useful format for a wider kind of audience. What we won't fund in relation to archaeology is where there are archaeological costs associated to a new development. So for example, if there's a load of housing going up, we're not going to fund the archaeology to be maintained that. It's part of the responsibility of the developer to do. And generally, we won't pay for post-excavation work unless it was part that excavation work was part of our project in the first place. So it's just things to bear in mind. We understand and appreciate that any post-excavation work is incredibly important. And if your project has included that, we would expect to see some form of report publication at the end of it. But it's making sure that it's all part of the wider project. It's that beginning, middle, and end. When I was putting this slide together, I thought it was going to be a bit like teaching my granny to suck eggs. Because a lot of this will be common sense to you. And that's because I'm speaking to you as a room full of people who have trained in this area. What I'm doing here is highlighting the key points that we would tell to community groups who are thinking of applying to us to do archaeology projects. So it's things that you can bear in mind as you're working with your groups. We want to see groups potentially taking the lead on these projects. It's finding what they're interested in and supporting them as they move forward. And a really good community archaeology project should focus and be about the group itself. What we want to see is the community archaeologists cascading their skills and expertise and providing their support to ensure that that project is well managed and that everything is done above board. So key areas that you can support your community groups in, and I'm sure you've probably been through this in a lot more detail, are to basically get them thinking early about what is going to be involved in this project. There is a lot to do in any project, and especially an archaeology project, that they may not have considered before. So get them planning it early and thinking about who they need to speak to. It's also going to be important to think about who they want to work with. Is part of their aim of the project to get new volunteers into their group? Is it to train their existing volunteers in new skill sets? 
Is it to work with local schools or to get local community groups involved? Because who they're planning to work with will most likely change and develop what types of activities they do, how they choose to share what they've learned with other people, whether or not they do digital outputs or whether they do hard copy, whether they're creating education packs or is practical workshop trainings. So think about that early because when we receive applications, we want to see that people have thought about what they're doing and why it's the best way to achieve that project end. You know this much better than I do. Get people to consider a range of archaeological investigations. I know the most exciting thing for a lot of community groups is they want to get their hands dirty and they want to dig. Sometimes they, have, they may have to think about non-invasive um, interventions. Also, the preparatory work that goes on before you should even start considering to do a dig. So the desk-based research, geophysical survey, those types of things are really important. So get them thinking about a whole range of activities that might allow them to interpret that site, to understand it. Also, especially if there's work on private lands, start developing a relationship with the owner early. For us as a funder, we are looking for public benefit to outweigh private gain. So if work is going on on private land, we need to make sure that, one, they're happy for that work to take place. We don't want anyone going onto private land, breaking, trespassing, it's not what we're about. We want to make sure that people have got those relationships, but also that they've thought about if they are doing actual practical digging, if they find anything, what is going to happen to those funds. So again, it's ensuring that they have considered the whole range of elements that they're going to have to work with throughout the project. Along those lines, are they going to need to talk to any statutory organisations? Are they going to need to talk to English Heritage? Are they doing looking at scheduled ancient monument? Are they going to put stuff into the historic environment record at the end? Get them thinking about who they might need to talk to and where they can get that support. And as I mentioned, publications of findings. One of the best ways to get this to happen is to get them sitting down early when they're planning and thinking about the briefs that they might need. They might want to start with a project plan and that will identify where they're going to need support and then help them to produce a brief for that work. So if they're going to need professional support from an archaeologist, how many days is that likely to cost? How much is it going to cost? Help them think about those elements that will need to be included in a brief so that they can understand what they should be asking. A couple more examples. I think is this the National Park here. Yes. <laughs> I think you guys have been involved in some of this. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so if you've got any questions, so Swaledale and Arkengarthdale Archaeology Group, or SWANG, because it's much easier to say, have been awarded £76,000 to undertake a three-year programme of community digs. So they're looking at investigating the Romano British settlements in the area and what they want to do is to train the local parish councils, the local schools, the local community groups in different techniques but then also as well to undertake digs in their own back garden to see it in um, public spaces where they can get permissions to do it. I'm sure as you move forward this is a really common thing. We are getting a lot of inquiries about this and it's one of those areas that we do want to see that people are getting support and these digs are being done correctly because it's really important as they move forward. They only launched, they had their address, their launch event, it was only a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and they sent me some beautiful pictures because they had Dr. Lewis this, who came to open it. So as you can see, Time Team is obviously featuring through in a lot of projects. With there being that kind of that public interest at the moment in history and archaeology, we are seeing a lot of groups interested in wanting to find out more and knowing how they can do it. It's an area that you can support people in as you move forward. The Works Education Association used a very important piece of research that was developed by partly by the gentleman at the back. Um, and what they did was they identified that archaeology doesn't always attract a broad range of people. I love some rice smiles in the room there. One of the things that they noticed is that often people with physical disabilities, mental disabilities, or from a diverse ethnic background don't always engage with archaeology. We don't necessarily understand all the reasons behind this, but they wanted to try a different range of approaches that might make it easier, break down some of the barriers and the assumptions to allow a wider range of people to engage. 
So they're running a range of different short courses to allow people to try different skills, whether that's identification of finds <coughs> and kind of geophysical survey and those technical issues. Also to give them the opportunity to go online digs. There was one of the things that they wanted to challenge was this assumption that people with, for example, physical or mental disabilities didn't want to be involved. What they found was actually people did, they just didn't know how to go about it. So some of the sites, certainly in the Yorkshire area, have opened up their digs to allow it. So at Connorsborough Castle, at Sheffield Manor Lodge, and at Healy City Farm, I think, have all been involved in making sure that there are opportunities for a wider range of people to get involved in the actual digs themselves. They've also given volunteer opportunities to students to allow them to undertake the guilds, the city and guilds qualification of teaching for lifelong learning as well, so that archaeology students um, can carry on and diversify their skill sets as they move into the, the job world. They've got a, a diversified CV. It's still ongoing at the moment, and I'm sure if you want to find out more about it, you can talk to um, Rob and the guys at Works Education Association. So, guidance on good projects and applications. The big question we ask is, why HLF, why now? And that is because, as I mentioned, we have a huge level of applications coming through our doors. It means we can't always support all of the good projects on the table, and we need to try and discern between them. So what we want to see is, are we the right funder? Hopefully, most people are coming to us because they have a heritage project. Also, why is now the right time? Is there an opportunity that you're trying to capitalise on? Is there a proposed development going on on the site that might destroy or impact the archaeology that you're looking at? So think about what is the reason you're going ahead with this project at this time? Who should lead it? As I say, we're looking to fund not-for-profit constituted organisations. That can be a local community group, it can be a CIC, it can be a social enterprise, it can be a local authority. So it's making sure that you work together to find the right person for that project. At different scales, that may mean that it has to be a different lead applicant. It doesn't mean you can't work in partnership and it doesn't mean there can't be support. It's making sure that there's the right applicant for that project. Proper planning. One of the reasons we reject a lot of applications is because they need to go away and they need to be thick. They haven't left themselves enough time to do it. They haven't factored in how long um, this, the research will take or how long it'll take to write things up. What we often get is certainly with oral history projects, people go, we're going to take 50 oral histories and then transcribe them all. We're going to do it in six months. We're a little bit worried about that because we know how long it takes. Similarly, you know how long it takes to do actual archaeological work. So make sure they think about and give themselves enough time to do it. Similarly, have they factored in the right costs for it? You know, are they going to need support, equipment, permissions? Those things take time and money. Don't develop a project in isolation. You have a fantastic network sat right here. Talk to each other. Find out if any previous work's happened in the area or if anybody else is thinking of doing similar things in the area. Share your knowledge, share your experience with each other and make sure that communities do the same. We're unlikely to fund the same project twice and we don't want to see projects coming in direct competition. If we've got two that are literally down the road from each other, we're unlikely to fund them both. We're probably going to say, go away, talk to each other, work together. Procurement. I thought I'd mention this because if you are, I know you spent a, a very useful session this morning going through looking at being a freelancer. For HLF, we have certain procurement regulations. So as any professional field service or work that is over £10,000, we will expect the applicant organisation to get three quotes for that work. We're not going to dictate who they choose, but we need to see that they've been out to an open, fair recruitment process. Similarly, if so we've seen some people do, they try and break it down, and everything's about £3,000, £6,000. If there are several pieces of work that will go to one organisation, and that will total over £10,000, similarly we would ask that they go out to procurement and get quotes. To say, it doesn't necessarily have to be the cheapest quote, it's the one that works for the group and for the site. But it's just to be aware that any group that applies to us will have to abide by those procurement regulations. And then be realistic. Make sure that what any project that comes into us is achievable, it's manageable, and that the group and all yourselves can deliver it on time to budget. Next steps. 
So if you are working with groups or as yourselves, you want to kind of come forward um, if you are part of a not-profit organisation, look at our website. I've highlighted some of the key program areas for you. And then if you've got a project idea, put in an inquiry form. It's a short question, it's about four or five questions, ask you who you are, what the heritage is, what you want to do, and how much money you're asking for. And our development teams will get back to you within about 10 days to give you a bit of a steer on the process and what to do. There's also some guidance on our website around archaeology projects. It is aimed predominantly at community groups, so as you read through it, don't be surprised if there are things that you say, okay, that's really obvious. It is aimed at community groups. So read through that. And then talk to your local development team. They're going to have the best idea of what's going on in your area, and also there are different levels of competition and demand in each area. So talk to them, build up a relationship with them as well. If you are based in Yorkshire, that's us. You can get in touch with us. I'm Catherine, and there are two other people in my team, which are Helen and Louise. So you can always call up and drop us an email, and we'll try and help you as much as we can. Thank you for listening. I hope I didn't run over my time or went too quickly. Does anyone have any questions specifically at the moment? It's either a good sign or a bad sign. We gave you everything you needed to. When you say community groups, mm -hmm. do they have to be um, a registered charity or registered with their name, or can it just be a group of individuals that have a, a like-minded focus? Um, they don't have to be a registered charity, but they do have to be constituted, and they have to have a bank account, so you need to have somewhere to pay the money. But we have a lot of, for example, local history groups, local community archaeology groups who are not registered charities, they're not the size or scale, it's not worth their while to be a registered charity. But so long as they have a constitution, that has the relevant not-for-profit and dissolution clauses, then they can apply to us. And if, they're, if they want to set up and get into that constituted state, you can direct them to their local voluntary action or community and voluntary services, and they should be able to give them advice and guidance on how to set up as an organisation. Do you monitor success rates in terms of ratios for applicants, etc.? Are they available as, as, as data to? We don't have it available as data. What we're looking for is, um, obviously, the projects are completed on time. Um, in terms of, we go back and we monitor and evaluate the projects, but we do it on a kind of, not an ad hoc, we, we basically we pick at random so that we can get spread from all of our funding programmes. We do have, as I mentioned, really high competition rates for all of our grant programmes, so we're awarding around about, I think it's about 33% the applications we receive but if a group is rejected there's nothing stopping them potentially coming back reworking their project to then apply again so that's what we're here as development teams to do to kind of help people understand why they might be rejected what areas they might need to strengthen if they come back again and is there any kind of uh, in terms of specific archaeological works any measures in place to ensure it's of a specific quality of that have we got to apply that you know the like um, standards etc don't ask for standards, but what we do look for is that it's been planning that they've talked to the right people. So that they've talked to either their local authority, to, their, to the relevant statutory agency, and we look at the briefs that they will submit for any professional support. And that's what we're looking for, is that they, they, if they don't have the experience to do it themselves, that they bring in the support to train them and make sure that it goes to that. We just ask them to put things onto the historic environment record once it's been um, done, and to make sure it goes into the right um, places. So it's for us as a funder, it's quite difficult to try and put very stringent kind of guidelines on groups. So we're looking to see that they have gone through that kind of planning process, identified where they need the support, and then they get the right support in to help them do that. What are the most common reasons for um, something to be rejected? Um, our broad term at the moment is insufficient funds, which is, it was a good project, it, it achieved a range of the outcomes well, but there were better things in that competition. The key reasons for that that generally need to be strengthened are need and demand. Basically, what we often find is that people have done the legwork, they've spoken to groups, they've found out what they want to do, they've worked with the local school, they haven't put in the application form. So they might, it's things like getting letters of support from the groups that want to be involved. And that's the key point, it's the people that are going to be involved in the project. We used to get a lot of um, less of support from a whole range, a whole host of the great and the good, but not the people who are actually going to be getting their hands dirty or actually putting in the volunteer hours. The other reason is that it's not properly planned. 
So they either have tried, sometimes they want to start the project before they're going to get a decision. So again, we are quite clear at how long it takes to get a decision. Don't try and start it before then. Also, they haven't factored in long enough. Or they haven't, for example, they've said they're going to dig in the middle of December, things like that. Those sort of elements. We are aware, we're not experts in any one field of heritage, but we have funded enough projects that we have a good idea of what will work, what won't. So those are the two key areas. And then the final one that I was going to say is that they're not showing, that, well, they're not, although they are achieving some of the outcomes, they're not necessarily achieving them very well. So it's thinking about how they can, so if they said they're going to help people learn about heritage, think about the different ways that they can do that. Think about the audiences that they're looking to work with and making sure what they're doing is suitable for that group. For example, if you've got a group of school children, there is no point in having degree level interpretation. They're not, it's not going to work. So we want to see that they've thought about who their audience is, is that activity appropriate? And again, for all those outcomes, what is the real difference that they can make? So how many people will train and receive skills? Those are the kinds of things we're looking for. Yep. You mentioned speaking to a local voluntary... Service. Community service. Okay. So there aren't as many as there used to be, but if you go online, there's normally one that will cover, for example, a local authority area, and they can support community groups in seeking funding, setting up, and kind of basically making sure that they're moving as a kind of going concern as a community organisation. You also mentioned that there obviously is a lot of competition you put your kind of little hands in the weeds for it. Yeah. Are there any kind of particular types of projects, particular areas of areas of heritage or particular groups you've identified you're actively seeking more from? Um, it's missing. In, in every local region we have what we call priority development areas. These are areas that have historically received less money from the Heritage Lottery Fund than others. This isn't ring fence money for groups from that area. So, for example, in Yorkshire, those areas are Doncaster, Selby, North and North East Lincolnshire. What it is, is it's support from the development team to try and raise awareness of HLF in that area and to ensure that when they put applications in, they're on a level playing field with other areas. So, if you want to find out more, each local area on the webpage, there's a section called In Your Area, it will list to you what those development areas are. As I say, it's not ring fence funding, it's support and development help. What's the, um, and I think an average time frame of, of if from starting to apply for funding being accepted and now actually having the, the funds to start, yeah? Um, it depends on the scale of the project. Yeah. So at the smaller end, yeah. we have some groups, so under the Sharing Heritage Programme, three to ten, we have some groups that put in an expression of interest, Within a month, they've submitted their application. Within eight weeks, they've had a decision. So they're basically within three months, some yeah. of them are up and running. Some of them may take several years if they are larger scale projects. Understandably, the ones that are at kind of two, three million pounds probably take a bit more planning. But you can go through the process at the smaller end of the grant programs in potentially three months. When you judge the success of projects, do it on, I guess, on the basis of the application, and is that kind of that's the contract, if you like? That is exactly it. So actually, when groups submit their applications to us, they're setting their own measurables. They're setting what their own success will look like, and that's what we go back and measure against. We want to see have you achieved what you said you were going to achieve? Have you involved the number of people you said, or delivered the different outputs you were going to do? So when they're writing it, that's why we say be realistic. I've never known a funder that is upset at a group overachieving on their targets. If you've met one, please let me know. But what we want to see is that you will achieve what you set out to achieve, and you'll do it well. So yes, you're exactly right. When, they, when people put in their applications, that, will, that is what we will evaluate against. The completion and evaluation reports that they put in all link back to what you've outlined in that form. In archaeological terms, what would the contract would be? project design, we look at scheme, if it's an uh, intrusive investigation, that's the thing mm -hmm. that we're really keen to see and to comment on. Um, um, we don't always, sometimes we do, some HR some projects will go, uh, we go out through the great line, others we don't. But what would be so brilliant is if there was kind of a tick box on the forum that said, 
I have run this pass. You are not, you are not the first person that's asked that. <laughs> we do have a question that says, um, I can't remember its exact phrase, but it's, who have you received advice from right. on the project? And what we're looking for there is that they've put down the key, the key names that we would expect to see. So, for example, the national park. If they're doing work in the national park, we want to see that it's open to them. If they're doing work on a scheduled agent monument, we want to see that they've spoken to English heritage. So, we are looking for those things in that area. Um, and if they come in for advice, if they put in an inquiry form, one of the things that we will always say is, have you spoken to your local authority, to English Heritage, to whoever has responsibility for that land? And in that guidance that we direct people to, there is a section about kind of permissions, who you should talk to. So, and there's a, I think there's even a list at the back. It's not necessarily obviously down to the level of in your, in your local authority you should talk to these, but it certainly gives the key areas and say, these people might be able to direct you to the relevant person in your area. So, the only problem we have with that is, although we can direct people to them, we can't guarantee that they will read it. So we do try, we emphasise on a couple of on a couple of occasions when we get the opportunity, you know, we need to speak to the right people, we need to make sure this is going well, and then we have to put the owners back on them to follow through on that. Do you have anything in place to kind of help people with sustainability and legacy of projects and groups once the time scale of the project is over? Right. What we ask for is within the application form that they think about that and they tell us how they're going to manage after the project finishes. So anything that they've produced or developed, where is it going to go? So are they going to deposit it in the relevant place? If they're developing a website, how are they going to host and manage that moving on? If they've got equipment, how will they manage and maintain it? So we do ask them about it and we will go back and evaluate um, at kind of several points post-life. Um, as we call it, post life of the project, to check that they are still kind of following those, but we can't do it for every project, so it has to be sort of spot checks. Again, we are relying on the fact that organisations that come to us are hoping to maintain themselves as they move forward and that they will develop their skills through being involved in the project that will improve their resilience as they move forward. It will hopefully give them the skills and expertise that they need to maintain themselves going forward in the right way. So we're hoping that through the project they'll develop extra skills, knowledge and experience, develop relationships and partnerships that will help them as they can 